consciousness is fundamentally uh, defined and people don't quite recognize this. It's kind of like the, the, the background assumption, but, but I think it's really important to bring it out into the focus here. Um, that consciousness is basically what does it feel like to be a human brain, okay? Because we are the people asking the question. We are the people with the subjective experience of being human brains. So we are essentially defining the question as, you know, this thing, consciousness. When we use a term like consciousness, it kind of implies that there's something objective about it. Again, it's not an objective thing. It is the subjective experience of what it feels like to be a brain. So there is no such thing as consciousness per se, okay? There is basically just the subjective experience of being a human brain. Um, and that literally means a human brain. And so if you think about like, well, what about animals? You know, do they have consciousness? You can't ask that question because that's like saying, do, an do animals have a human brain? And by, by definition, animals do not have a human brain, okay? So end of story, animals are not conscious because all we know about consciousness, we know as the human experience, okay? And obviously, in many ways, objectively, people, humans, are very different from other animals. And so there's lots of things that are different about our subjective experience and our objective brain uh, function that is going to make it very hard to say, you know, what animal, uh, what animal subjective experience is like because our brains are so different. And if we were comparing like two species of dogs, um, one of which was us, so, you know, whatever. And, and then we were like, okay, well, there's this other species over there and they're really, really similar to us in every way that we could, could identify. It would be much easier to say, yeah, they're probably, you know, having the same subjective experience. And fundamentally that's the same problem of other minds. Uh, if I look at other people and start to say, well, does that other person have the same consciousness kind of experience that I do, the same subjective experience, the same qualia, because they have the same brains, they have the same kinds of behavior, uh, everything else is sort of more or less the same about them. I'm pretty comfortable saying, yeah, probably they, yeah, they do, right? Um, so, but again, when you go out and you try to say, well, how does this apply to animals? How does this apply to AI? uh, you know, systems, um, how do we evaluate what other kinds of things have consciousness? The only thing we can do is say, well, to what extent do they have certain kind of properties that are similar to our human brain? Again, human is the definition of consciousness. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's, we'll never know because we'll never be able to get inside those animal brains or those AI brains and know for sure subjectively what they experience. That's the fundamental divide. But we can sort of, you know, guess. And we probably don't want to spend a huge amount of time making these guesses because, again, we'll never know the answer. So it's like, what's the point? Um, but on the other hand, of course, it's very intriguing because consciousness is, of course, the thing that we cherish the most about our own subjective experience. And so, uh, we want to know the answer, even though we can never know the answer. So we can kind of think about like, okay, well, you know, uh, great apes, they have a lot of similar properties to our own brains. And so probably they have some kind of similar subjective experiences. On the other hand, they have all these differences. They don't have language. They don't have the same kind of culture that we do. They really have a lot of differences compared to us, but they probably have a lot of similarities. They pass a lot of various kinds of tests that people have created to kind of test whether people have consciousness. Um, we'll talk about those actually more in the social chapter. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, well, it's, they're probably a bit like, you know, semi-conscious or something. Um, and, you know, we can ask about babies, right? Human babies. At what point does a human baby become conscious? There is an interesting question. You don't know the answer because when you were a human baby, you weren't writing stuff down, right? You weren't talking about consciousness. You weren't kind of, you know, trying to compare your subjective states with other people. And so maybe were you conscious? I don't know. Uh, so that's a really challenging question as well. Perhaps that's a more tractable kind of question. Like what, what do we really think developmentally? When does consciousness emerge uh, in, in human babies? Um, okay. Uh, anyway, it's all speculative, even though, you know, because we can never go back to being our baby selves, even though we once were those baby selves. 
Um, yeah, and so uh, the other thing that's a big limitation uh, having to do with these kinds of language issues, you know, if we could have an animal like a great ape or somebody, you know, a lot of these uh, chimpanzees and gorillas have been taught to, to do sign language. And it's conceivable that when they learn this sign language, they could actually communicate, you know, some kind of, you know, real nature of their subjective experience. What does it feel like to be you, Mr. Gorilla, you know, or Miss Gorilla cases. Um, and, uh, and so they didn't, you know, they basically, and maybe they did. I mean, it's kind of, they, they sign a lot about like wanting food over and over and over again. And, you know, apparently Coco had an obsession with nipples, apparently I read about. So, um, Maybe that's really what the subjective experience is about, is a kind of a, an overwhelming train of thought associated with primary rewards. And again, we'll, we'll pick up some of these issues again in the social psychology chapter, because that's where we start to appreciate one of the big differences between people and other primates is our incredible social orientation, how much we care and how much we want to share with other people. Um, and that, that fundamental social orientation and, and you know again a lot of great apes do have a, a strong kind of social uh network a social you know tribe kind of uh dynamic group dynamic um but ours is is obviously kind of qualitatively stronger and in, in, in really important ways and so we try to share our experiences with other people in a way that other primates don't um and that gives rise to this ability to kind of have this shared subjective experience through literature, through telling stories and those kinds of things. Um, and so that's how we kind of get a sense of what other people's subjective experience is like. And because other animals don't seem to do that, uh, we don't really have a basis also for understanding kind of what their subjective experience is like. So maybe with future AI systems that, that you know, we can actually make sure that they have a good uh, language facility and can maybe write some useful uh, subjective uh, poetry that would tell us kind of what does it feel like to be that AI. Uh, I don't think personally that there's any fundamental barrier to doing that, right? And that, so that goes back to this substance dualism. I don't think there's something special about the human brain that causes it to be, you know, a, a magic portal into another dimension of, you know, mind ether that is outside of the physical universe. Uh, and therefore, I don't think that there's any limitation uh, in recreating the critical features of the brain in some artificial system, silicon, you know, uh, system, for example. And, and so I do think someday, perhaps, you know, when I'm still alive, uh, we will have this kind of uh, situation where we can really see what another kind of, you know, brain system is like and, and what kind of subjective states they're experiencing. Okay, so now we're done.